You're a scuba diver? Aren't you afraid of sharks? Isn't it dangerous? What if you run out of oxygen underwater? If you've ever asked or been asked these questions, then this video is for you. In it, I debunk 10 of the top scuba diving myths. Let's get into it. I'm Thomas Hughes, a professional scuba instructor, and I'm here today to debunk your myths about scuba diving. Myth number one, diving deep. One of the first questions non-divers will ask scuba divers is, how deep have you been? Honestly, most of the stuff recreational divers want to see can be found within the first 60 feet or 18 meters of water. It's warmer, clearer, often brighter and full of more color as well, and really your air is gonna last longer the shallower you are too. Of course, there are sometimes reasons to go deeper than 60 feet, such as different shipwrecks that you wanna see, or if you're a technical diver, you might wanna go even deeper just as a maybe deep exploration type thing or something like that. But in almost all cases, honestly, 60 feet or less is more than enough to see any of the coral reefs that you wanna see, any sea life or even large animals and sharks and things like that too can be at 60 feet or less or 18 meters or less. Myth number two, tropical diving only? Many people seem to think that the only diving you can do is off the coast and basically only in the tropics or you know down in the Caribbean or something like that. In reality, you can dive pretty much anywhere that there's water, whether that's in a lake, the quarry, a river, or you know in cold water too, up in the Arctic and down in Antarctica. There's actually a really well-known cave diver, Jill Heinrich, who wrote a book called Into the Planet, and she actually did a dive in inside of an iceberg. So literally an, an iceberg that has underwater caves basically that are just from the ice melting. She did a dive there too. So, you know, you can dive anywhere that there's water. Personally for me, yes, I've dove in the warm waters of the Caribbean, but my daily dive site or my, my regular dive site here locally is actually an old abandoned mine that was a rock quarry and it flooded and turned into a lake now. Where I got certified, that was also a big lake that uh, was basically where the river started pulling up into a, a wider spread area. And we just have a nice big lake that we can go diving in. There's even decommissioned nuclear missile silos that have been flooded that you can dive in. And there's one in Texas that I'm really hoping to go to. So if you'd like to see that video, comment down below. And it's been on my bucket list for a while, but maybe a comment would motivate me to go ahead and make that trip out there. Some of the best diving in the world will actually be in cold water environments. And if you follow the channel Dive Saga, he just recently was in the Great Lakes up in the Michigan area and dove in the ice up there. They did ice diving. And there's shipwrecks up there in the Great Lakes too. And that is cold water diving. So there's plenty of sea, cold water, warm water, missile silos, lakes, quarries, rivers, no matter where there's water at, you can go diving in it, not just in warm tropical water. Myth number three is scuba diving is dangerous, right? Okay, so like any other activity out there, there are do's and don'ts that keep you safe while doing that activity. If you think about it, snowboarding, hiking, bicycling or, or cycling, even cooking has dangers to it, right? We have open flames when we're cooking, we might be cooking with grease that can burn us and hurt us, right? We can burn down our whole house. So if you think about it, any activity you do has those do's and don'ts, the rights and wrongs, the things that keep you safe and the things you should never do because you can injure or kill somebody. Scuba diving is really no different than that. There are rules that we follow that teach us to be safe, conservative divers. We should always have backups of things that we're doing. We should always dive with a buddy, for example, and there's just things that we always do and we just plan our dives properly to make sure we're safe underwater. Unfortunately, the truth of it is that most dive incidents, actually 90% of them, happen due to human factors or human elements where something like complacency came into play or just a poor decision was made and, you know, not sticking to our fundamentals and having proper training can cause major issues underwater. So if you're curious about that, I'll have a whole video up in the cards and down in the description about deadly mistakes that beginners make and things that can cause, you know, fatal accidents to happen. So you can check that out after this. The funny thing is, is that a lot of non-divers think that scuba diving can be dangerous out in the ocean because of sharks actually. And you know, oh no, what about a shark attack? And I'll touch more on that in just a moment. But real quick, if you're getting value out of this video, consider sharing it with one of your friends, whether they're a diver or a non-diver as well, because we really wanna raise awareness about these myths and basically busting these myths as well. So we can get more people in the water, more people scuba diving. Myth number four, what about sharks? Well, my answer to that is, what about them? I mean, sharks, yeah, okay, they're apex predators. They are large beasts that are human killing, right? Wrong. Sharks are not that dangerous underwater at all, and they're actually extremely cool to dive with. 
Now, before you hop in the comments and start linking to me all the different incidents of people getting hurt or injured by a shark, yes, of course, there have been injuries and shark attacks that have happened out there, sometimes provoked, sometimes unprovoked. But if you really think about it, how many of those have happened? Well, the actual average is 10 fatal accidents per year due to a shark attack, or basically 10 fatal shark attacks per year. Now, this is an average and it's 10 per year worldwide. So if you think about all the different people in the ocean, all across the world, 10 per year, yes, of course there's a danger there, I guess, but it's a pretty minute danger. In comparison, a much more scary statistic is that there are eight deaths per day, not per year, just in the US, not worldwide, from texting and driving. So if you text and drive, like many of us have done at some point in our lives, I'm sure, unfortunately, eight deaths per day in the US alone compared to 10 worldwide per year of shark attacks. Continuing this analogy, deer actually kill 130 people per year due to the car accidents that they might cause by running across the road. And to really just beat this point into play, dogs, yes, the lovely cuddly dogs that we all love and have as pets, they are actually the fourth deadliest animal in the world when it comes to attacks on humans. Unfortunately, dog attacks have killed about 25,000 people every year. So I guess I'll ask you, what about sharks? At the end of the day, they're really just another fish out there. And yes, they're big, beautiful fish that we can learn, study, and enjoy from a distance or even up close on a scuba dive. But are we really that worried about them attacking us? Shark Week is in July this year, so go ahead and check out the card or a link down in the description below, or just subscribe if you wanna check out my playlist on Shark Week and all the shark facts that I have as we get closer to that date. Myth number five, but scuba diving's pretty expensive, right? Well, sure, let's talk about that actually. So to get scuba certified, it's gonna require an e-learning component that you can do online on your own time, pretty much on any device that you want out there. And then there's gonna be an in-water component where you're gonna spend six to eight hours in a pool doing sessions with a instructor over one or maybe two days where you're practicing different skills. And then you do these open water checkout dives where you spend two different days diving in a uh, more open water conditions, whether it's in a lake or out in the ocean out there with an instructor reinforcing the skills and actually diving and practicing what you've learned. The cost for this is actually about the same as any other hobby that you'd want to pick up. This could be a weekend of spending time with an instructor learning how to mountain climb. It could be four yoga lessons that are with a private instructor, or maybe two or three kayaking lessons as well, where you learn how to kayak with a guide. One of the differences and benefits of scuba diving though is your certification is for life. And yes, if you haven't been diving for maybe a year, you probably want to do a refresher and you know, hopefully you're diving more than once a year anyway and practicing these skills after your training. But that certification is for life. You never have to get recertified again. You might just need to go through a little bit of a refresher if it's been a while. The other thing too is you can rent all the gear that you need and yes you know picking up your own gear over time is a nice to have and I have a whole video all about gear and what you actually need. I'll leave a link up in the card and down in the description below about that but rental gear is perfectly fine for diving if you're just going to go a few times a year it's probably more economical for you to do it that way too. When you start comparing this with any other sport or hobby that you want to pick up, it's actually about the same, if not cheaper, to do this. And sure, dive trips can get more expensive, and if you want to go fly down to the Caribbean and stay at a resort for a week, then okay, sure. But you're taking a vacation at that point, and it's not really fair to compare that to you know going golfing for a weekend or you know something like just a single golf golf outing uh, to hit a course for nine holes or something like that. Myth number six. What if I'm not that strong of a swimmer? Okay, so yes, you need to know how to swim up to a point to go scuba diving, and I'll talk about that requirement in just a moment. But in general, diving's considered a bit of a lazy sport once you get underwater. When you're diving, you should be very conservative with your movements. You aren't gonna be swimming with your arms a lot and pulling yourself along. You should never really get out of breath or overexerted at all. And basically it's kind of the complete opposite of a competitive swimmer. We're gonna be doing slow, long strokes with our kicks, not using our arms or hands to scull or pull ourselves along at all. And otherwise we kind of just sit and float in the drift and just kind of enjoy our environment and what we're looking at around us. Now, yes, like I mentioned, there is an element of knowing how to swim. So there are two requirements in your open water certification that have to do with swimming skills or swim testing. The first is that you need to float or tread water for 10 minutes. And this can really be just lying on your back floating if you'd like. 
The only real requirement is that you don't use any flotation device, that you stay above water for 10 minutes, that your face and mouth and nose basically stay above the water. So, you know, that could be just floating and holding your breath with your cheeks pulled out and you're just bobbing above the water. As long as you don't touch the bottom, as long as you don't, uh, you know, hold onto the side of a pool or use some type of floaty or something like that, you're good to go. So 10 minutes of lying on your back floating, that's the requirement. The other one is that you have to swim a 200 meter or 200 yard uh, lap pool. So most pools are 25 meters, 25 yards. So, you know, maybe it's out and back eight times uh, or I guess out and back four times for 200 meters, 200 yards. And basically doing that swim in any time limit with any stroke that you want. You could even doggy paddle the whole time as long as you don't stop, you continue the whole time, you don't touch the bottom or anything like that. So continuous swim for 200 meters and that's it using any stroke you like so even if you're a little bit of a weaker swimmer yes of course you know you should be in good decent physical shape to be able to complete that have your medical forms checked out and all that fun stuff but in general you know it's it's not that difficult of a swim and because there's no time limit you can kind of just take your time conserve energy and finish that whether it's backstroke breaststroke freestyle you know doggy paddle again whatever you want to do so no you do not have to be a very strong swimmer or you know at a elite excellent you know expert level swimmer or anything like that some other things to think about here is you know if you can't swim definitely get some type of swimming lessons and you can get started with that but also there's a lot of adaptive techniques out there these adaptive techniques actually still allow them to earn an open water certification. So again, even with paraplegia, amputation, or other physical inabilities, you're still able to earn an open water certification using these adaptive techniques. So learn how to swim basically, you know, finish that 200 meter swim or, you know, 200 yard swim, be able to float or tread water for 10 minutes. And that's really the only requirement there. Myth number seven. Okay, so you guys are breathing oxygen underwater, right? Well, not exactly. So the air we breathe on land every day is about 21% oxygen and 78% nitrogen, where that last percentage is a bunch of other gases mixed up in our atmosphere. So that said, what we put in most scuba cylinders or scuba tanks is actually air or 21% oxygen, 78% nitrogen or 79% nitrogen. And that's our normal air and our normal tank that every recreational diver learns how to scuba dive on. The next most common thing that we might do is we will enrich the air by adding additional oxygen. So it might be a higher percentage, usually somewhere between 30 and 36%. We call that nitrox or enriched air nitrox. Uh, that requires a special certification and that basically allows us to have a higher oxygen blend, which without getting too into the details of it, it allows us to stay a little bit deeper longer, uh, depending on how deep we're going and all these fun factors. The other use case is there is something called technical diving, which is separate from recreational diving. And technical divers might have a bottle of, let's say, 80% oxygen or maybe even pure 100% oxygen that they use to help with their decompression uh, as they're stopping on the way up to allow themselves to off-gas their nitrogen load. Again, I won't get into all the details of that as this isn't a uh, training video necessarily, but some technical divers will use a higher blend or maybe pure 100% oxygen depending on their dive profile and things like that. But that is much, much, much less common and not the norm for recreational scuba divers. Otherwise, breathing 100% oxygen is pretty much only used at the surface in the case of an emergency where we have to put a diver on 100% oxygen to help with maybe decompression sickness or some other type of injury that requires oxygen as the treatment until the emergency services can come and take care of them properly. Hopefully not getting too in the weeds here. The reason for this is breathing 100% oxygen at depth or basically anything deeper than 13 to 20 feet or four to six meters is gonna raise what we call the partial pressure of that oxygen way too high and the oxygen will become toxic to us. So oxygen toxicity occurs, which can cause major issues issues with the lungs or with the brain uh, that could be permanent damage or maybe even fatal as well. So we do not breathe 100% oxygen underwater. We breathe air, the same thing we do at the surface in almost all cases, except for those few caveats that I mentioned. Myth number eight, but learning to dive takes a lot of effort and a long time, right? Well, no, that's also not that true anymore. So yes, in the early days, there used to be more of a military boot camp style, lots of drills and skills and things like that to go scuba diving. But, you know, we found that for recreational diving, a lot of that can actually be taken care of through some more basic skills and less intense exercises that the military needed compared to recreational divers. So since then, and as time progressed, recreational scuba diving has had a number of improvements that have made diving more approachable and much easier for people to get into. To start with, the World Recreational Scuba Training Council, or WRSTC, was established and basically set standards for what recreational divers need to learn, and all the scuba agencies, whether it's 
PADI, SSI, NAWI, or another agency, they all have to be basically recognized through the standards program and make sure that the skills that are taught in open water diving meet their standards. Another thing that happened is dive computers became much cheaper and much more accessible to people and basically took care of the dive planning for us, where yes, you still want to dive a plan and plan your dive and all of that fun stuff, but you aren't necessarily pulling out dive tables and doing lots of math and figuring out all these different individual components, which were much, much more difficult and you know came from the US Navy basically. So with dive computers, recreational diving became again, way more approachable and less involved. So you don't have to spend weeks of training and drills and learning how to read these dive tables, for example. And finally, another thing that came out is the idea of e-learning or online learning, basically, for many different courses, especially in the last few years since 2020. Many, many, many courses that were not available online have been made into online formats now. So students, depending on the agency and what class it is, can often just log in from any device and anywhere in the world take the e-learning course online and then do the in-person practical skills with an instructor in a pool or in a pool-like environment or maybe out in open water, depending on the dive that they're doing to go ahead and kind of complete that training for them. So, you know, no longer are you like going to a specific classroom and having to schedule time just for the instruction piece for the classroom portion. You can actually do that training online, self-taught through the e-learning piece and then, you know, spend the time with the instructor in the water instead going over your skills. So with all of that in mind, recreational classes can actually teach you and have you earn your open water certification in as little as like four days now, which is kind of crazy. And, you know, after that, you're certified, you definitely want to still practice your skills. You want to do additional training. You might want to seek out um, additional education by taking further certifications. But, you know, at the very least, go out, dive, practice skills more and, you know, just become a safer diver by practicing even more. But getting certified in four days is a lot less effort than you might have thought when you first looked into scuba diving. Myth number nine, I'm just too old and too out of shape to do this whole scuba diving thing. All right, look, like I said earlier, scuba diving does have physical aspects to it. You have to carry your tanks on a boat or off the boat. You might have to carry some heavy gear until you get into the water, but there are ways around this and dive buddies can help you out. And you know, depending on where you are, the dive operation might help you get in and out of your gear in the water instead of having to put it on and get to the water carrying all that gear. I've actually seen people of all shapes and sizes as well as all ages go scuba diving and have had no issues whatsoever. And I myself am a little bit of a bigger guy that's working on that as part of my own personal health, but I've never had issues with it either. And when it comes to age, I've literally dove with people that were in their late 80s and had no issues diving whatsoever. Now, like any other sport or activity that you're thinking about doing, if you are receiving active medical care for any specific conditions, you have prescription medications that you take, any ongoing health concerns or anything like that, you should absolutely seek a consultation with your physician or your doctor. We actually have a medical form that you have to take before you take a certification class anyway. Uh, it's good for one year, but that certification form or that medical form will basically have a whole questionnaire for you. And if you mark yes on any of the boxes, it doesn't mean you can't go diving with us. It just means that we wanna have a physician check you out to make sure you're good to go. And again, I recommend getting the physical before you go diving anyway. If your physician isn't super comfortable with filling out diving type material, they can always call Dan, D-A-N, dan.org. And Dan will actually uh, give them a whole walkthrough basically. Dan is a nonprofit organization that uh, does studies and research and does a whole bunch of medical stuff all around the, the medical side of scuba diving and the safety and health aspects of scuba diving. So the uh, Dan providers can actually go ahead and help your provider with filling out those physical forms um, and getting you, you know, ready to go scuba diving or determine if you are ready and able to scuba dive. Like I said, don't let this stress you out or anything like that. I know people that have had asthma that have been able to go scuba diving or, you know, maybe had heart surgery surgery two years ago and you know their cardio was good enough that they were able to go diving and not be stopped or anything like that. So consult your physician. This is not me giving medical advice. I'm saying the advice is to consult your physician or doctor before you enter any new activity of any kind. Scuba diving is no different than that. And myth number 10 actually came from a comment that I received on one of my early videos on my channel and it had to do with claustrophobia and basically that fear of being underwater with a mask on, just breathing from your regulator and feeling the anxiety of, oh gosh, you know, I'm, I'm underwater. I can't just go to the surface. I can't just do this. I can't do that. What if I can't breathe? All these types of things. 
So first and foremost, if you have claustrophobia at all, I definitely want to approach this with empathy. I understand, I can definitely understand how you might feel with being underwater, breathing from a regulator, you know, having that uncertainty, especially if you're a new diver or you're just getting certified. However, I do want to say that the people that I have been diving with that I know have issues with claustrophobia, they've actually found that diving has been a very freeing experience for them. Once they remember that they can still take full deep breaths with their regulator in their mouth, just deep breath underwater, relax, no problem whatsoever. And they realize they actually feel more open and free because of the open floatiness of being underwater compared to on the surface where it's much louder, you, you feel the, the weight of all the gear on you and things like that. But underwater, just remember that you can just take those deep breaths in and out from your regulator, open up your eyes, just enjoy what's around you and realize that you are in such a nice environment. Um, you know, you can't always go to the surface. You shouldn't be any type of overhead environment or anything like that. And, you know, be a safe, conservative diver with your buddy. If you do have issues like this at all, make sure you tell your dive buddy, talk to the instructor or the dive guide and let them know as well. And, you know, they can hold your hand for you if you'd like while you first go in the water. And that's totally fine too. Now, if you do experience claustrophobia sometimes, but you still wanna try diving and just aren't really sure if you wanna to commit to a full certification course yet, that's no problem at all. There's a whole idea of discover scuba diving or try scuba that you can do instead. The whole point of this program is that you can try out scuba diving without committing to a full certification program and just kind of see what it's like to be underwater in a pool or a pool-like setting. And in this video, I talk about the whole setup of Try Scuba so you can understand from start to finish what it takes to try out scuba diving with a local dive shop of your own. Click or tap the screen now so you can check that out. And with that, stay safe, have fun, and let's go diving. <music>